Should I get off stage and walk on or am I okay? No, you're good. <clears throat> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA. The Catalyst webinar series is a weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. We're very excited to have the one and only Kevin McDonald on the program this morning. Kevin is a certified club manager. He's been in hospitality for decades and decades. In, uh, in 2003, he became the official paid staffed coach for the leadership coach for the CMAA and uh, occupies that title uh, to this day. He speaks on leadership and coaching leadership at conferences around the globe. He is a also has been the uh, coach for the Canadian or the British Columbian PGA. Kevin, thank you very much for joining us this morning on the Catalyst webinar. How are you today? I am fantastic. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, John? Absolutely. You sound great. You look great. And uh, like you said, uh, and I, I'm, I can attest to this firsthand, that uh, you are not such a bad guy once we get to know you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I uh, <laughs> <laughs> And John and I have gotten to know each other really well because every technical difficulty that could be known to man has sort of been, we've been dealing with to make sure we get to this point where you can actually see and hear. And so thank you so much for, for inviting me, John, and thank you so much to all of you for attending today. Well, it's kind of a, it, it's a significant catalyst for all of us because we have the Catalyst webinar, just a little backstory on the Catalyst. The Catalyst has been going on for over four years, and I think closer to five years. Through this whole uh, uh, history, we've been using gotowebinar.com. And then when COVID hit, uh, the capabilities and the, the, the uses of Zoom are are uh, better suited to uh, our needs in terms of um, being able to take questions and see where the questions are coming from and make it a little more of an interactive experience for everybody involved. So this is our first Zoom. You're on the inaugural Zoom Catalyst. And uh, thanks for braving it for us. It's all okay, well, take it away. Thank you. Thanks again, John. I can start this program differently than any other program that I've ever spoken you know, any other time I've ever spoken because uh, uh, four hours ago, I got a, I got a grant, a new grandson, uh, Congratulations. My grandson, uh, second grandchild. And, um, uh, you know, I know my wife was thinking about, uh, you know, if the baby's healthy, if it had all its fingers and toes. And, and honestly, I, I was thinking about, I, I wonder what golf courses we're going to get to play in my lifetime with this young, with this young boy. It's a, uh, it's an exciting time. My, my granddaughter uh, was born in Hanoi, Vietnam, and has now moved back to Canada. Her father is a golf pro, so I got a, it's probably a better chance that I'll be playing with her a lot at, at various places. But uh, I love this game, and uh, I love the game that you are all dedicated to, and uh, it's a passion in life. And so when I got to be able to be in the club industry and, and work at a, at a couple of golf courses, um, it was like being home. It was uh, it was an environment I always loved. And so in 2000, I changed careers. I became a coach and uh, I really found out that the part of club management that I really loved the best was developing people and developing their games. And not like you develop their golf game. I developed their leadership and their communication skills and their ability to be great people. And so when that when I made that transition, I had a great relationship with CMA and they asked me if I could put together, could I coach 7000 people at the time? I didn't know how I could coach 7000 people. And so we created a number of ways for people to experience coaching concepts, coaching in groups, coaching individually. And the truth is 7000 people don't want coaching. And I'm sure at your clubs. You know, if, if you have look at how many members you have, how many want lessons, it's a small percentage and it, it tends to be the people that are at the top of their game. And we just did a presentation at CMA conference, why the best in class employ coaching. And, you know, it's really it's really evident that, um, you know, when we get to work with extraordinary people and the, the the average or lower performing people are really not interested in coaching and 
And I got to tell you, I'm okay with that. You know, I get to work with the people that are really driven and, and really want to be at their best. So thank you for having me here today. We are, um, it's interesting. I think yesterday, I thought my grandson might be born on St. Patrick's Day, but um, a year ago, yesterday was the last time I was on a plane. And uh, I had a speaking engagement on the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th of last year of March. And on the 13th, the world changed up here in, in our country and the government uh, told us to uh, be careful. And uh, so three of those places canceled. I couldn't get the fourth one to cancel. So I had to go and came home in, in an uncertain time. And it's, so it's, it's really uh, this program, you know, I think is as much as it's about leadership and about you being at your best, it really has the, co the context of what's just happened to us and what is still happening to us in a certain respect. So, you know, really talking, I'm gonna talk about leadership, but I'm also gonna talk about some of the things that we've really been experiencing with people, observing with people as they go through what we've all been going through. And and I'm sure all of you, I mean, that you're probably the, the experts at it. Um, oh my goodness. John. Yes, sir. Oh, wait. I got it. No problem. So let me just start out by saying a few things that uh, we've noticed with what we've been talking to people last year, whether it's at, you know, through clubs, we've been do working with a lot of clubs over Zoom, a lot of ch chapters of, of CMA, world conferences, and, and also individuals, is that this past year, the, some of these elements that are typically part of what makes a great leader and part of what makes a great human being, were exaggerated. You know, I think this is a time when when a lot of these things really became more important than they ever were before. And so I'm just going to start with communication. And I'll say this, that when I get to go to clubs or chapters all over, if there's only one thing that I would work on with people, it's their ability to communicate well. And I, you know, I don't have to tell, you know, such a big part of your job is is communication. And, you know, the way we communicate really shapes our lives in many ways. And, and I think the, the, the people who have problems in life probably have problems with communication. The people who, you know, the organizations that have trouble, it probably is based in communication. And during this time of COVID-19 in this pandemic, I mean, the ability to communicate to, our, to the masses, to the members, to the staff, to communicate in difficult times when difficult decisions have to be made was was really um, exaggerated and, and put into the forefront. And so I would just say this as, as we're starting here today, we, you know, we, have an extra, we have a program called the Extraordinary Leader Program and we have a number of pros in it, but we spend a whole month on communication. You know, it's that important, it really is. And so whatever, you know, however you are as a communicator and, my partner Shelly and I are, are trained communicators who sometimes don't communicate well. And I think that's part of the realization, the awareness that, you know, even if we think we're really good at it, we could probably improve. So, you know, one of the things I would suggest, you know, for you is just check out your communication. And by the way, I think at the end we give out my information, but any tools or any help I can give anybody in any of these areas uh, please just ask me for it and I'll send them to you and I would love to share that. But work on your, how is your communication? How have you been, you know, talking to people and, you know, how have you been listening? How have you been communicating? What have you been communicating? And are we having sometimes those tough communications that it's hard to have? And if there's any of those things that you'd like support with, that's the kind of things we do as coaches to help people navigate those conversations. The second thing I put here is that we're, ma we're managers of energy. I've had people who in the industry tell me that, you know, when their club was closed and they were working a lot fewer hours um, than they used to when things were operating properly, that uh, they were going home exhausted. And, you know, it has, it, it's a, everything has changed and, you know, the pressure has changed and, and, you know, a lot of people were losing or didn't have the energy. And I always say this to people is that we are managers of energy that, you know, think about what you do in your, in your career, in your job, in your families, you're managers of energy. And if you don't have it, it's pretty hard to give that to the members, pretty hard to give that to your teams. And so 
when we think about it, there's three things you can do with energy. You, you can uh, create it, you can store it or conserve it, and then you can expend it. And in each of those areas, it's worthy of looking at how are you doing. So what are the things that can give you energy? Things like a good night's sleep, um, good diet, good food, good water, an amount of, of uh, hydration. But maybe it's uh, music, or maybe it's listening to a podcast, or maybe it's learning or hanging out with really your friends that light you up and energize you. But whatever it is, in these times, it's even more important to make sure that you are coming to work with energy, coming into your life with energy. And our job as coaches is to bring out the best in people. And, you know, no matter how hard we try, no matter what our intentions, if the energy's not there, it's pretty hard. So the second part is conserving energy. And as coaches, we we look at people and, you know, one of the things that that leaks energy out of out of us are things called tolerations. And it's something coaches look at with people is what are you tolerating? And, you know, we, when we tolerate things, you know, we often tolerate something because not dealing with it may be easier than actually dealing with it. You know, if you tolerate a, a squeaky door, you tolerate a piece of equipment that's not working. If you tolerate a person on the team that's not buying in or is or is a cancer on the team, if you tolerate it, it takes energy from you and it takes energy from others. And so when we when we are helping people, you know, in, in their uh, looking at themselves, that's one of the things we look at is what are we tolerating? When you get rid of tolerations, you can serve energy better. And then the last part is expending it. You know, I mean, uh, what are you giving your energy to? And that's that's really important is that, you know, we have all sorts of people, all sorts of distractions are going to try to take our energy. The, now more than ever, it's our time to get clear on what the important things are. Make sure we're giving the energy to the things that really matter. So that's a little bit about energy. Um, our job as coaches is oftentimes we give people awareness, you know, just like you watching somebody's golf swing. Um, uh, you can see from the outside what they can't see from the inside. Uh, my son-in-law had played a number of rounds with me and he said, tell me about your swing. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, tell me what, how you swing. I say, well, I swing from the outside in. He goes, no, you don't. You swing from the inside out. I said, how is that possible? I hit them way right. He goes, yeah, because you also hit them left. And he says, it's not about your swing path. It's about your hands at, at impact. They're open or closed. We never know which one. Okay, well, now I have that awareness. And when he took me to the range, I was so excited. Just, just you know, obviously old habits die hard, but but I now am aware of what I wasn't aware of before. And that's really what we do in coaching is we help people, you know, look at, you know, we have beliefs or we have things that we do because we've always done them that way. And when from the outside as a coach, we're looking at people and saying, well, you know, it's not that it's good or bad, right or wrong. Is it question is, is it working for you? And that's really what it comes down to is you want to you want to create habits, behaviors, thoughts, beliefs that are really driving you and moving you towards where you want to go. I, I wrote here, take care. One of the things that. Um, we of all the people we talked to and we talked to Joseph Mich Joseph Michelli who wrote a book he interviewed 140 P leaders during the uh, pandemic and, and uh, you know he said that's one of the biggest things he heard was that people really had to be very very aware of taking care of themselves in this time because we you know we're in a we're in a business where we often take care of everybody else and uh, you know, if we don't take care of ourselves, uh, we can still do the job. We're just not going to be brilliant at doing it. So, so just one comment to all of you is take care. Again, something you could, if you want to call and find out more how to do that, then I'd be pleased to talk to you about it. We have a formula for results. Um, we give this to people when we start at any club. We always give three foundational things, and one of them is this, is this formula to achieve anything in life. You want to lower your handicap you want to you want to you know get rid of debt you want to lose weight you want to whatever you want to buy a boat whatever it is here's the uh, the formula to get whatever you want t plus f plus a equals r our thoughts plus our feelings plus our actions equal our results and so you know what we find is as coaches on january 1st a lot of people want to lose weight and so they uh, we ask them what they're going to do they say they're going to go on a diet they're going to join a gym and uh, they've done that before and it hadn't really worked before, but they're going to do it this year. It's probably going to work this year. 
as if the formula is A equals R. And again, you know, if they think and feel the way they always thought and felt, and they just change the actions, they're going to default back to what they've always done. That's with me as my golf swing and my golf game. If I, I have to think differently, I have to feel differently, I have to act differently if I want to get a different result. And so think about that as you're training people or if you're leading people, or if there's some challenge you're facing this year, your thoughts plus your feelings plus your actions equal your results. I can tell you as a coach that a lot of people are trying to get somewhere and they've got thoughts and beliefs that are working in opposition to what they're trying to do. You know, they believe something that is in opposition to what they're trying to do. And if we don't change that belief or we don't challenge it, we don't change the way they're thinking, probably going to get a similar result. Uh, I use the metaphor of a magnifying glass. If you put a magnifying glass between the sun and a piece of paper, you know, if you put it too close, scattered light, too far away, same thing. But if you put it right at the right level, you get this fine beam of light that will burn the paper. That is the focus. And so many times with whatever we're trying to do, we've got thoughts that are making it blurry, like we're too close or too far and we can't, we can't do what we're trying to do. The other side of that is that if you take that same magnifying glass, put it between a light bulb and a piece of paper, you can get that same fine beam of light, but it won't burn the paper because the intensity from the sun is so much greater than the intensity from the light bulb. And so you can have the greatest idea in the world, but if you don't have the passion, if you don't have the drive, if you don't have the discipline, if you don't have the right emotion about it, then it's probably not gonna work. But if you have the right thoughts, the right feelings, the right actions, it's pretty not hard not to get to where you wanna go. So think, maybe that'll help somebody. Again, always things you can talk to. One of the things we found this past year was that a lot of the leaders who always uh, thought that they needed to solve all the problems, they need to have all the solutions, were this year because you know there were so many question marks and so many unknowns, really started involving their team more in in ideas and brainstorming and decision making. I think everybody, you know, the people that have really changed that way of of operating have really benefited from it. So. You know, don't be afraid to use your team to find out what you don't know or to get a different opinion that you have. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to go with all their opinions, but I mean, at least you you engage them and find out and get different per, uh, ideas and perspective. And, and the last thing I have here is perspective, is that, you know, as coaches, um, everything is about perspective. You know, there's some people that, have taken the challenge of the last year and it has just knocked them down. There's some people who have been thriving. You know, there's some people that, that get to um, decide how they see things. And we all have different perspective, but uh, your job sometimes is to help people change their perspective. Your job sometimes is to, uh, you know, make sure you're, you have things in perspective. This is one of the concepts I always start with is that, um, when, if that, if a white page, a piece of paper, if you took a blank piece of paper and you put a, a dot in the middle of it, that naturally, if you hold it out at arm's length, the first thing people look, you know, what people are focused on is that dot. And, you know, we say this, that in life, if that piece of paper represented your life, um, you know, you have a lot of days in your life and some of them are, are dark days. We have some dark things that happen in our lives. Um, you know, the birth of my grandson, this is a pretty bright day. This is a white space day for, for us, for sure. Um, and yet sometimes there's, there's things that happen in life. When I started the coaching program, CMA, a lot of the time I was talking to people who had lost their job. So if you lose your job, it's a dark day. And, uh, you know, so, but, you know, and when, and they would call me and tell me that their president just brought them in and said, they're going in a different direction, didn't include them. And, you know, they're in that dark space. And when you're in the dark space, your energy is low, your creativity is low, there's not a lot going on for you. And I'm, you know, I'm there with them in that moment, but I won't let them stay there too long. Because as a coach, when you're, you know, in not a lot of great stuff happens when you're hanging out in that dark space. So outside of that dark space is possibility and connections and colleagues and friends and fun and opportunities and you know and almost everybody I work with finds a better uh, a better thing after they go through the dark thing 
And so that is what we're talking about with perspective. It's just, what are we focusing on? What we tend to focus on, we get more of. If there's one member, one board member, one president, and we've all been there. <coughs> I know I have. <clears throat> and um, the more you focus on the pain and suffering, or you more the focus on the anger and resentment or whatever the emotions are, the bigger that, that dot gets. And there's some people that go to work and all they see is the dot. And, you know, if, if you're experiencing that, then call and get some support with that. But you might have somebody on your team or you might have some members that, you know, there's there's 99 great things at the club and there's one thing that isn't is what they focus on every day. That's human nature. We've been trained to focus on the negative. You were all trained to look, you know, when you look at that page, to look at that dot. And so, you know, let's understand that, that we've all done it. And it's it's our, it holds us back. And so when we start to move to the white space, life gets better. So here's some things that we've seen that get in the way of the people in leadership in the past year or any time. But, you know, we often say that the way we think, sometimes the way we think is the enemy in that things change. And this is a rapidly changing time. And so sometimes the thinking the way you always thought is what gets us in trouble. We have to think differently. We have to be open to changing our views and changing our minds and seeing other points of view, I suppose. But, you know, I mean, hey, we'd all like it to be normal. It's not normal. So, it, you know, so forget how it was when it was normal. Let's adapt to what it is now and think differently. And, you know, in some ways, maybe we'll never go back to exactly what we had before. Maybe it'll be better. And uh, I mean, I a year ago, I'd never been on a Zoom. Now I do eight, some days, seven, eight hours of Zooms and, and uh, I'll be in, I'll be doing three presentations today in different parts of the country. That wasn't possible before. So let's, you know, let's think, you know, it doesn't have to be the way it's always been. Um, I'm a big proponent of the four agreements. If you haven't read that book, uh, when I go to clubs, I always recommend it or when I'm coaching somebody, but the third agreement is don't make assumptions. And we are assumption making machines. We make assumptions um, every day, many, maybe a hundred a day. And the, you know, Don Miguel Ruiz, the author of the book says an assumption is just one or two questions short of complete communication. So if you assume something about me, you can just ask me a couple questions and find out if your assumption is correct, but we've been trained sometime not to ask questions. And here's what I would like everyone to write down is this simple thing we tell a lot of young people that are coming into the business, but it's true for everybody. The person asking the questions is in charge. The person asking the questions is in charge. And I think a lot of times as leaders, we think we're supposed to be the ones giving the answers. The person asking the questions is in charge. I, I speak for Dick Coplin every year, uh, the Coplin Keebler Wallace Group, and uh, to the young legacies that they're bringing up in the industry. And, and uh, I made this comment one time and Dick said to me, when we take a candidate to a search committee, search committee asks a whole bunch of questions and then uh, the search committee will say to the candidate, now tell us what questions do you have for us? And the candidate says, I'm good. Then they know at that moment that the candidate is not good. You better have solid questions. You better find out what you're getting into. You better find out what they're looking for. You better find out what the challenges you might face are. You, you, you know, get really good at asking questions. Get really good at asking questions. I admire my, my son a lot for asking me that question. What's my, tell me about your golf swing. Like I never even thought about it really, but I assume because I hit it right, that that's, you know, that's the ones I remember. I also hit them well. So, Next one is the need to be right versus successful. I'm always amazed how many people just need to be right. They don't care if they lose. They don't care. As long as their idea carries the day, it doesn't matter how it all turns out. To me, that's just ridiculous. You know, you know, that's why, you know, get other people's opinions. It doesn't matter whose idea things are. It doesn't matter if you want to be successful. You know, I think that's one of the things that we found in CMA is that, a lot of people don't want to admit that they don't have it all together. And so they don't want to ask for help. They don't want to, you know, so I know I can do it all on my own and I don't need anybody else's help. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just why, 
if you want to get somewhere, why wouldn't you get somebody to help you to get there quicker? And there's so many opportunities. And I think as, you know, as men, we've been, you know, I'm speaking on the, that behalf of that gender, but I think we've been trained um, to not ask for questions or to think we can do it on our own to be independent. And one thing I can tell you is that, uh, man, ask for help, ask for help. And uh, I, I'm, I've become very good at it. There was a time where I was not, I'll admit that, but uh, man, why would I not ask for help? It's a gift to ask somebody for help because when somebody asks you for help, if you ask me for help, it's a gift to me. And so don't be afraid to give that gift to other people. Okay, uh, number four, one thing gets in the way is the inability to have difficult conversations. You know, people sometimes shy away from them. They, they avoid them. They put them off. Oftentimes when we do that, they things get worse. They get bigger. And so um, uh, there's something. If that's one thing that you have to do, if you have to have a difficult conversation, maybe contact me and, and ask me to help guide you through that. We have a document called the gift of communication. Anybody wants that, email me, ask for the gift of communication. And there's a piece in there about dealing with difficult questions. And then finally, me versus we, uh, you know, I think, I think this time, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of leaders are willing to uh, see it as our challenge, not my challenge. And, you know, they can employ a hundred versus doing it themselves. And, and, um, my good friend John Furlong, who was a club manager here in Vancouver, where I live, uh, went and did the bid process for the Olympic Games in for 2010, and then he ran the Olympic Games. And between employees and volunteers, he had 50,000 people to put the games on. And uh, I never heard him use the word I. You know, it was always us. It was always them or or, you know, it was always about his people, not about him. And so uh, uh, just think about that for you. How's that, how, how are you in that, in that context? How does that, does that get in the way? So um, one, I quickly, uh, I've got 15 minutes left, I think, uh, is that right? Uh, yeah, it is John, okay. Um, one of the, one of the opportunities, and uh, if you haven't read, by the way, this, if you haven't seen this, uh, resource before there's a book called turning pro by Stephen Pressfield and um, again here's something if you want it there in in the book Steve, uh, Stephen Pressfield who wrote the legend of bagger Vance in the book turning pro he he makes a list of a amateur traits and professional traits and it's really a powerful thing to look at and if you I mean I'm sure many of you have seen it but if not, um, you either email me and ask me for it or get the book. Uh, but in this in this list of attributes, you know, I think when I when I read the book and saw it, I realized I caught, when Shelley gave it to me and I said I emailed her and said, you know, I realize I'm a professional with amateur tendencies. And of course, we are professional at some things and quite amateur at other things. And I'm an amateur golfer, uh, for sure, but I love golf. It's a passion, but I'm an amateur. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with being an amateur golfer. It's just what I am. And yet in other areas, I feel like I'm a professional and I have those attributes. And it, it's worthy of looking at it because as a leader, you know, we think, well, we, if we're a leader, then we must be professional at all the aspects of leadership. And that's probably not true. You know, some of them we're quite amateur at. You know, we, we just because you get the job title doesn't mean now you're good at everything that person needs to do. And so each year, each day, each month, uh, we encourage people to consider reinventing themselves. It could be, it could be a small, you know, a little R reinvention, like, you, hey, I'm always late to, hey, I'm always on time. Or it could be reinventing your, your life, your, um, your career, your business, your your style it could be the, your look i don't know it could be all sorts of reinventions but pro, one you know one of the listings that that it says in the book uh, by stephen pressfield is that professionals reinvent themselves you know so you know they're always looking for a way to improve they're always looking to change and get better and and uh, and evolve 
And so that might be something for you to consider. And we have a document, we have a tool we created called the reinvention of you. If anybody wants that, just email me. So our, our leadership training in our, in our program, our, in our uh, extraordinary leader program, one of the tenants we talk about all the time is the three A's, awareness, action, and accountability. And you can think of that as your, if you're thinking about teaching a student, you know, that T plus F plus, plus A equals R, you know, are you just teaching them the A? Or are you teaching them, are you helping them with the other two? But really, you know, when you think about it, when, until they get the awareness, until we get awareness, we can't change something. Until we know we have the challenge or the problem, until we see, you know, what we're doing and what impact it's having, until we become aware of it, uh, you know, we, it's hard for us to, to improve. And, you know, there's, most of us are pretty, on, pretty poor in the area of self-awareness. We think we know ourselves, but we only know ourselves from our own perspective. And so when you can have somebody look at you from the outside and become more aware of what these actions are doing, how is this manifesting my success or my failure, you become aware. Then we want to, as coaches, we want to move people from awareness to action. So, you know, now that you're aware, now you need to do something. But in our business, and I think in leadership and in being a golf professional, teaching a student, you know, this third A is critical, is that the accountability is with, in my case, the person I'm coaching, in your case, the golfer, or in your case, the, the back shop person or the assistant pro or whatever, but the account of, we have to teach people to take accountability and own it. And, you know, I think a lot of people have been trained that if I'm going to hold you accountable, that's somehow connected to punishment. And they're afraid of accountability. We want to have people embrace accountability, become accountable for their own success, their own lives and their own achievements. And so as a coach, you know, when somebody dramatically changes their lives, that I've been working with, it's not about me, it's, it's about them. They're the ones that had to take the accountability to make it happen. Conversely, if they, don't, if they do nothing, and if they don't make any change at all, and they, you know, they can point their finger and say, well, he wasn't a very good coach, but it's really about them. And that has to be an awareness everybody has. How do we help people be accountable? Uh, our program, the extraordinary leader program always every lesson every month in a module if it's communication if it's vision it always starts the first lesson is always about you so leader lead thyself you know you have before you lead others before you're going to be great at leading others you've got to look at yourself you've got to know your game you've got to understand your weaknesses and your strengths and how you operate and, and how you might be getting in your own way but as you work on yourself and you become a great example for everybody else, then they'll move in your direction so much more effortlessly. So I'm challenging everybody here to consider yourself leadership. How are you doing? Uh, how are you doing in leadership for you? How are you leading yourself? And then, of course, how are you leading your people? You know, how are you leading your people? And are your people following? That's a good indicator. And are they following because you've got the title and they have to, or are they following because they believe where you want to take them? So think about that. Uh, in the reinvention of you, uh, there's two words here, I am. And I believe that the two, those two words followed by anything are the most powerful words in the English language. And so what are you saying you are? Uh, I am, if you say I am happy, I am, sad, I am wealthy, I am poor, I am tired, I'm I'm energized. You, you know, whatever you say, your self, your subconscious mind will help manifest that. And so, so many times we're hearing people use language about themselves that is really working counter to what they're trying to do. And so what, you know, I, I can tell you one day when I discovered this and I made a series of I am statements, uh, it, it, and I read them fairly frequently, uh, it really changed me. So think about that for you. And then finally, just focusing on daily habits. If you want to move in a direction, make get put in the daily habits that are going to get you there. Uh, not once, a, once every three, six months or not once a year, but daily small 
seemingly insignificant habits that are going to move you to be the person or to be the leader you choose to be. So, uh, John, we're almost there. Here's a few things I would say uh, for leaders uh, from a coaching perspective uh, that can really support you in bringing out the best in your people. And the first one is just being a great acknowledger. I, uh, I had some surgery uh, a few months ago and uh, uh, they kept me in overnight and there was, a, there was a, a male nurse that was there and I watched him talking to everybody and then there was a female nurse throughout the evening. And then the next morning, the male nurse came, I could hear the female nurse telling the male nurse about me and my situation. And um, uh, he listened to her and he comes in and he goes, man, she's my favorite. She, I got to train her, she is unreal. And I said, I know, she is fantastic. Uh, she really is a great nurse, but I gotta tell you, I was watching you. And I said, I was watching you with the patients. You're fun, you're funny, you listen, you ask really great questions. You know, you get very uh, gregarious and fun when you need to. You get very quiet and professional when, when there's something confidential that's going on. Um, you care about your people. You educate them. I just said, I was blown away just watching you. You are amazing. And he was quiet for a moment. Then he looked at me and he said, he looked at my name on the wall and he said, Mr. McDonald, you just earned some of the best narcotics that I can get my hands on. And, you know, it's so funny that, you know, it's, it's so simple to acknowledge. It's so simple to see something in someone else. It's so simple to, to just, you know, notice, just take the time to notice what people are doing and, and, and then I notice what they're doing right. You know, Southern California, I'm a, a, we've had Ken Blanchard on our, on our program a number of times and, and, uh, you know, he was a, when I was a young man, I read the one minute manager and I, I was, you know, it changed my life. It changed how I was parenting. It changed how I was leading people. And then in later in life to be able to say that I've had a number of great conversations with Ken, uh, Dr. Blanchard. And uh, but his his thing in the book was about catching people doing things right. And so, you know, in these times when everybody's going through something and everybody needs to know that you think they're doing okay. And when they when they hear it from you in the uh, in the words of uh, some great guy from San Diego, uh, I'm kind of a big deal. Well, you are kind of a big deal when it comes to when you acknowledge somebody, when you see them doing something, it's a big deal. And don't underestimate the power of it. And you might think, well, I shouldn't have to tell everybody that they're doing things right. Yeah, you shouldn't have to. You get to. You get to. And don't underestimate the power of it. Uh, another thing that you get to do is reframe things. We talked about that with perspective. But, you know, help people see the opportunity in the situation. Help people see the other side. Help them, help them see the way they're looking at the problem is, is not the only way to look at the problem. Or help them to see, um, you know, what's possible. We teach three levels of awareness, uh, and, and those levels are judgment, acceptance, and appreciation. So when something happens, we tend to judge it. We want to make it right or wrong, good or bad. And, um, you know, we do that in the beginning. And then after a while, whatever the situation, you know, hey, this COVID is really terrible. We hate it. You know, it's awful. It's ridiculous. We have to go through this. Well, it is what it is. So after a while, you become the second level of awareness is acceptance. Okay, well, this is where we are. This is what we got to deal with, you know, and then perhaps you can get to the place where you have appreciation, where you have appreciation for it. You know, I'm not going to be able to hold my grandson. I don't know when I will, you know, and, and would I like to? Absolutely. Do I want to get him sick or to get anybody in the, his parents or anybody in the, you know, no. And you know, so it's it's an inconvenience, but it's, a, you know, we're going to stay healthy and we're going to have a, a hopefully a long uh, life together. And so we, were, we, we, we get to reframe things. Uh, honest communication, I mentioned before, ask questions and then listen when they ask the questions. You know, that's where the power is, is in your listening skills. Genuine listening means suspending memory, judgment and desire and for a moment at least, existing entirely for the other person. 
Genuine listening means suspending memory, judgment, and desire, and for a moment at least, existing entirely for the other person. Man, when we, when that complaining member comes up to us and starts talking, you know, our memory is taking over. We're not even listening. You know, we're, oh, here we go again. You know, this, oh, this guy, every time, that's all we ever hear, memory. When somebody says something, we tend to judge it. It's right or wrong. It's good or bad. I agree. I disagree. You know, it does. just listen. Listen before you get in the way of yourself. And then memory, judgment, desire. I think a lot of times when we're listening to somebody, we just want something to happen. Let's get to the result. Let's get to, I want, you know, I want to get to a conclusion. I want to get some sort of result out of it. That's fine. But when you can just suspend those three things and just really listen to somebody, you may hear them differently than you've ever heard them before. Memory, judgment, and desire. You know, in terms of uh, communication, meet more than often than you think. Um, when it comes to people, you know, keep everything in perspective. Be compassionate. You know, we're all going through something here. Every one of us. And, we, and if we're honest with ourselves, probably none of us can say we're as good as we normally would be. You know, in some ways we're better, in some ways we're not, but we all have a weight. We all have something that's keeping us from doing the things we love to do. And so, you know, I'm certainly, you know, being connected to your friends or, you know, and again, maybe it's different in Southern California. I don't think it is. You know, I think we're all, we're all going through it, but the people you're working with, the people you're serving, the people you're working for, uh, they're all going through it too. And then the last thing is don't be afraid to get support. Don't be afraid to get to reach out if there's something that you can do to, to be better, if there's something you can do to be a better leader, a better listener, a better coach, a better teacher, uh, a better parent, a better spouse, then don't be afraid to ask for it. And, uh, you know, why wouldn't you? So, John, thank you so much for, uh, for letting me, uh, speak today and uh i know we're going to open things up so uh why don't we do this why don't i i'll stop sharing my screen oh actually before i i i think the last thing i was all my contact information so i uh can i start yeah, actually uh if you could kevin if you could go back to sharing your screen so that everyone has an opportunity to get the contact information um okay. they've got uh now, uh, Bryce, can you hear me? Bryce, are you there? Yeah, John. How do I uh, how do I unmute all so that we can take questions? Or is that uh, a bad idea? Oh, it's not a bad idea. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you just let them unmute themselves when they uh, when they're ready to speak? Yep, they can unmute themselves, John. Okay. Well. Kevin, uh, wonderful presentation. Oh, thank it, uh, you. you know, it's eye-opening when you talk about listening because you know, I uh, uh, no mis no misconceptions about my ability to listen. Me personally, I need a lot of work in that department because when someone is talking to me, I am locked on memory, judgment, and desire, and the the uh, the uh, the underlying movement to work towards a a swift resolution and those things are going in my head and you know that's why you can't hear people when they're talking to you and uh i think nobody's more guilty of that than i am but, hey uh, can i give you some feedback please well i gotta tell you and you know you and i have spent in the last two or three days we spent a fair amount of time together and as i was struggling with some things uh you were incredible like you were nothing but supportive and um like you you never made me feel bad about it like i you know i i, I don't you know when it comes to pro and amateur when it comes to technology definitely amateur definitely but you were you were just so uh supportive and so i never felt like you were you know were going off on a different tangent or a new or you were i mean obviously we we had a desire to make it work but you were very kind in how you approached that. Thank well, you. thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. I just have a tremendous amount of gratitude for what you do for a living and taking the time to, to help educate us. 
Um, I'm very grateful. Very grateful. Do you think so, I can get uh, rid of this? Do you think I can get rid of the screen? Do you think people have had time to write down the, anything oh, yeah. they want? Well, and not only that, Kevin, not only that, uh, I like to send out a recording of the, uh, the presentation that we put on YouTube and uh, they'll be able to access uh, your contact information through that. I also include a PDF version of your PowerPoint, just because the PowerPoint itself is awful big to be emailing. We'll okay. include a, uh, a PDF uh, version with that link uh, notification, um, thanking you and thanking everybody for being on the Catalyst this morning and talking a little bit about who our, uh, our next week's uh, presenter is. So uh, yes, feel free to take down your PowerPoint. And okay. for the Thanks. members that are on the uh, webcast this morning, you all have one of the beauties of why we are switching to Zoom is to make it more interactive and make it a little easier for you to ask questions. Uh, in the past, you'd have to type in a question on the question box and then I'd have to actually read it uh, to the presenter. Now you can simply unmute yourself and ask Kevin uh, the question or make the statement or uh, anything that you had in mind. Um, we encourage you to do that at this time. I just assumed if I was talking to people in Southern California, everybody would be on camera. It looks like uh, Rand Veal. Looks like he's unmuted. You but please turn your cameras on if you could so we can see you, I appreciate it. Any questions from the field? I, I've never time. seen this where nobody, we can't see any of the people. That's I've never seen that before in a Zoom. Well, they don't want to be seen, Kevin. That's, what? Uh, that's kind of what it is. I had a question uh, okay. regarding um, one of the acronyms that you used during the presentation. Let me find it. Um, T plus F plus A equals R. Obviously, R equals results. Yes. Well, can you talk a little bit about T plus F plus A equals R? Yeah, our thoughts plus our feelings plus our actions equal our results. So that's, that's a quiz thinking. question. So that's yeah. thoughts plus, that feeling, plus actions equal results. Plus feelings? Yes. Yeah, so if you're if you're teaching somebody golf, I mean, you, you can give them uh, drills and you can do things to help them with technique and in, in terms of uh, uh, their swing or their putting or their chipping or whatever the, the the action is. But when it come, but if you really, you know, if they don't think like a lower handicap, if they think like they're a 30 handicap and you teach them better skills and, you know, if, if they're getting close to you know, shooting 90, they'll probably throw a few sevens in there at the end just to get back to their comfort zones. You, you have to think, you know, have to change the way they think and feel. And um, I've had the, a couple of times I've had the benefit of playing with some golf pros who made me feel like I was a pretty good golfer. And, uh, and I tell you, it just was a different game, you know, because I, and I had that self-belief, I think that, that they helped me have because they must know what they're talking about because they're pros. But, um, yeah, you have to change your thing. You're not just don't just change accents if you want a different result. Uh, Nathaniel, Zachary, uh, Heather King, do you have a question for Kevin? Please show. Please put your camera on if you can. It's a shy group, Kevin. How is I that possible? That how is that possible? I just assumed all golf pros were really good looking. You know, they're they're full of self-confidence and, and, you know, they probably look like a million bucks. Some of us more than others. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Kevin. On behalf of the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA, thank you very much for taking the time to share your expertise with us. We are eternally grateful for... Uh, Everyone on the uh, Catalyst webinar, thank you very much for supporting and for joining us this morning on our first Zoom Catalyst. Join us uh, again next Thursday, 8 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. We look forward to serving you. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Thomas. Take care, Kevin. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe. Stay sane.